Uh, right now, I'm going to introduce Dan Burden. He's with uh, Value Added Ag Extension with Iowa State University. He's going to moderate the Market and Industry Trends Panel. Um, Dan works with entrepreneurs, producer groups, state and federal agencies, and also works as a commodity and business development specialist in the areas of oil seed and biomass utilization, aquaculture, specialty crops, and agro-tourism. He's a regular contributor to the Ag Marketing Resource Center and actively assists, manages, or participates in various state, national, and international development projects. So please welcome Dan Burden to the podium. Oh man, is this cool to be here. Um, Ray Hansen and I with the Value Added Agriculture Project, uh, Alan Patillo with Natural Resources uh, Management Group on campus. I mean, we've been working in this area for a number of years and it's great that we're at this point right now. We've got producers here, we've got people from the support community, we've got potential producers interested in, in doing this and um, it's great. So anyway, I'm going to be uh, introducing a few folks this morning, and then a little later on, Alan and I are going to be, or mostly Alan's going to be doing an overview of what's going on in Iowa right now. It's, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Stuart Heinerfeld. Uh, a lot of us just know him as Chef Stu, our fishing buddy, but... Um, Stu Heinerfeld began cooking at five years old in New York when his parents came home at midnight finding him sleepwalking and making eggs in his sleep on a hot stove. His sister and brother were asleep at the time. Since then, he has owned and operated Aunt Maud's restaurant in Ames, worked for Gilbert Robinson's Plaza 3, California Pizza Kitchen, Hyatt Hotels in Waikiki, and operates the Greenbelt Bed and Breakfast. He's a financial consultant and ha was a franchisee with a Merit Prize Financial for 14 years. Stu graduated uh, from the Culinary Institute of America with honors in 1972. He has a BS from Iowa State University and the Mercy School of Emergency Medicine, uh, becoming a nationally registered paramedic. Uh, his restaurant, Aunt Maud's, was the subject of a feature story in the New York Times in 1978, and that story was reprinted coast to coast. Stu currently operates his bed and breakfast and does food consulting and events for many of our aquaculture producers. And uh, I got to tell you, Stu is just a neat guy, and man, is he a great chef. It's my pleasure right now to introduce Stu Heinerfeld. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. About 1979, 1980, I was in the kitchen at Aunt Maud's preparing food. It was, uh, we had started dinner rush. One of the waitresses came back into the kitchen and she was crying. And she was really crying. She was really upset. A gentleman at one of the tables from the East Coast, I'm from the East Coast, had um, started insulting her and saying that back in 1979, 80, 35 years ago, there's no way a restaurant in Ames, Iowa could be serving fresh fish. I went into the kitchen, into the walk-in cooler, and I picked out a 35-pound king salmon. I had been up in Soldat, and we fished the Kenai down to Cook's Inlet with some people from PIC, some English chaps from the old Pig Improvement Company. Well, I met with the guy in Soldat and from Sterling and arranged to fly king and halibut silvers into Ames. I digress. Went into the cooler, picked out a 35-pound king, it was swimming in Cook's Inlet um, two days earlier. I made sure I got a big one and a wet one covered with ice. I went out, I had a hot head in those days. I went out to his table and his jaw dropped. Seriously, I haven't, his jaw dropped. And I made sure I hit the table with the fish so the ice hit him. And I can remember a piece of ice going in his mouth and he didn't close his mouth. And I said, sir, do you, I pulled the gill slit up, and I see how, and you can see it over there on these fish, how bright red that is. And you, uh, I said, that's because it's full of oxygen. You see the eye on this fish, how bright it is? Can you see yourself in it? And he, I said, don't you ever come in my restaurant and accuse me of larceny or fraud. If I say it's fresh, it's fresh. Now that's bringing fish in. Right now, we're a 91% importer of fish. And I'm hoping that someday we can start getting that down to about 65%. But 
because that's what you're here for. This last July, I went up to Canada for a fly-in fishing trip. Um, Jeff and Mark Nelson were kind enough to give me about 14 pounds of barramundi to take up there. And one of the fair, I, I fished with fairway managers, the directors of several stores. So we were crossing the border with barramundi, and we were kidding around, hoping they would, you know, they would ask us, because we thought if they found us sneaking fish in, one of them might have a stroke. Who f sneaks fish into Canada? So I was waiting and hoping that he would say, do you have any firearms, fresh fruit, vegetables, Australian raised biosecure fish? He didn't ask. So anyway, we made our way up to Red Lake and um, we were to fly out the next morning at uh, supposedly at 5.45, 6 o'clock. They always tell us to be there. We never get off till 7. So we get weighed in. And we're going in two, uh, two aircraft because there's two lakes, and we're connected by a river, Peace and Knox. So my group, me and some fairway managers, we got on our plane, and I took seven or eight pounds of um, barramundi with us, and then I sent eight pounds, seven, eight pounds, with the other group. Second night, we were there. We cooked it. My group uh, fried it, the shore lunch. It was delicious. They loved it. They really did like it. And I, I query them to make sure they really do like it. And um, the other group, one of the guys has cancer and he has a compromised pancreas, so he can't eat the fat. So <laughs> they broiled it. And I knew they would. Over the next four days, I was going to ask them, and this is the truth, four boats came up to me because there were like eight managers in the other lake. Each boat came over to our boat to tell me how good the broiled barramundi was. And the fact it was broiled gives a little bit of um, gravitas, whatever, to the fish, because it eats so well. This continued, and four boats came up and copped me on it. And I'm in the middle of you know, God's country crying in the boat. They love my barramundi. So it was fantastic. You will eat basil honey dressing today on your tilapia. The greens, the basil, is grown in the water that the fish came from. This is uh, part of aquaponics. I recently had a conversation with a group of folks at friends, a friend's house up north about um, how, bar how Bower Monday tastes. And uh, I've actually fed most of the people that have been involved in this process over the last year their first taste of barramundi. <coughs> Here's my official description of how barramundi tastes. Because of the high protein level, it has the same protein level as salmon, it eats similar to salmon. It has the texture or mouthfeel of salmon. The finish, aftertaste, of ocean bass or mahi and the color after cooking of halibut. This is my official opinion, official opinion. Excuse me, I am your market. In the future, if you become part of the future aquaculture farmers of America, I am your market. I am a hotel. I am a restaurant. I am a country club. I am an institutional server. I'm Saga Foods. I've worked for all and done all these things. You are looking at your receptive market. What do we want to see and what are the buzzwords? For people like me, for high V seafood department managers who I've talked to, we want certain buzzwords. And those buzzwords are fresh, American grown, Central Iowa, Webster City, biosecure. And that's what we're looking for. And when I talk to people about this, their eyes light up. And I get an incredible response from the fact that this fish has grown here. I'm available to you folks once you get involved in the process, whether it be growers or investors, whether it be shrimp, barramundi, or tilapia, for events, for training, for marketing, anything you need if you have any questions. Um, 
I hope you enjoy your lunch. Your bar I didn't mention your barramundi will come out with a lobster sauce and um, a melange of locally grown um, grains from quinoa to couscous to um, barley. So I hope you enjoy it, and uh, thank you so much for allowing me to get out of the kitchen for a few minutes. It's very nice. Thank you. So we had Stuart kind of give you an idea how chefs feel about the, these products. Um, now I'd like to introduce Mr. John Roars. John is going to tell you about what we want in that middle of the value chain, that what the distributors look for, the people who are going to be moving large volumes of product. John is a seafood manager for Perishable Distributors of Iowa, most of us know it as PDI down in Ankeny, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of hy V Incorporated. He purchases, as well as oversees, the procurement of all fresh and frozen seafood for hy V's retail stores. John works directly with suppliers, processors, and brokers of these different products. John oversees hy V's seafood sustainability program. He works directly with hy V's marketing, advertising, uh, supervisors, and store personnel. John is a member of the Food Marketing Institute, Seafood Sustainability Committee. John holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Northern Iowa, and we won't hold that against him today. Um, John's worked as seafood department manager in hy V's retail stores, and he has uh, completed all HACCP training, and all of those other things. Uh, he's with, um, he's also, uh, uh, he's received his HACCP training from ASI, the food consultants. Please uh, help me in welcoming John. Welcome. I always like to check out the clicker and see how it works first. Um, Honestly, guys and ladies, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm more excited to be a part of this and seeing a great group of people here um, to see that the future is and potentially in aquaculture. Um, day in, day out, I can't stress enough, uh, both Chris and Chef, those guys hit it on the dot. All those information, Chris to the T. I mean, I deal with it, uh, marketing trends, what's going on in aquaculture day in, day out. He hit it on a tee. So I'd really take all that information he put provided for you and really look at that. He, I mean, he put it out there for you, and that's truly, truly what's going on. Um, I kind of want to just touch on a quick thing, just kind of add to his slides, because um, he did so well. On the catfish industry, um, they're in trouble, I'll be honest with you. Um, we deal with several domestic catfish suppliers. Uh, the problem with them is obviously dealing with the imported catfish, or a lot of people may know as swai or striped pangasius. They are probably about two, three years behind um, catching up, I mean, as far as domestically. Um, they ran into issues with pricing, uh, giving the farmers money. Um, and as you can see, I don't know many of you guys shop at stores and stuff, seeing the drastically increase in catfish. Um, a lot of that has to do with feed. A lot of that has to do is they're paying the farmers more as they should. And so, but that's a big issue. You're never gonna compete with imported product as far as price, because they obviously, they can raise it cheaper, bottom line. It's just one of those things. What you guys can do is spread the message on local, fresh, you know, as Chef said, and one of the main reasons I'm so excited about it is we love the fact that we can say, hey, the bare money we're serving or selling in our stores is literally 45 minutes away. I mean, we can have our own trucks pick up at their facility potentially in the future. I mean, how great is that? I mean, rather than hearing, where's this product from? Oh, it was raised in China, but processed here, and then now it's here in the United States. That's, it, that's global seafood, that's where we're at. That's what, there's no way around it. You know, you saw the demand for seafood. You saw where the, you know, where our population's gonna be in there's strictly not enough seafood out there. Um, when you're looking at wild um, compared to farm raised, aquaculture is the future. There's not enough fish out in the ocean to provide for the demand. Um, Alaska Seafood has one of the strictest um, sustainability policies in the world. I mean, they're the model for sustainability. And they'll tell you, you know, it's just, they may backlash farm raised salmon, but they say, we need them. We don't have the resources, we don't have the product to provide for the demand, and it helps them. It helps the environment, you know. It, it's, 
it's all one piece, you know, and you can read all the thing, you hear backlash, and I'll tell you there's, the, Chris hit it right on a dot, search, Google search seafood. Probably 95% of the stuff that pops up is negative. Is that true? Probably not. I mean, that's just media for you. They'd rather tell a story about some negativity than rather than positive aspect. And I tell you what, there is a lot more positive stuff going on in seafood, um, even locally and imported. Um, and some of the imported stuff is some of the best in the world. You know, the facilities are state of the art. You know, they have higher guidelines and specs to meet than the U.S. standards. And people don't realize that. You know, you read a lot about floppy where, you know, it's raised in sewer ponds. Well, yeah, it is for local community, you know, local people. That stuff never even leaves the country. You know, that's on a small scale. You know, you're looking at, you saw the aerial photos of some of those in the Maine Kong Delta. That's how it is. I mean, those are the large state-of-the-art facilities over there. Um, and you see that aquaculture is truly the future. So I just want to compliment both Chris and Chef. I mean, right on a dot. I mean, that's a day in, day out. I wish I could talk more about that, but they really hit home. Chris is, I mean, all his data he provided is, is absolutely right. When it comes to sourcing seafood, um, as you heard, um, both mentioned sustainability. Um, that's the number one trend out there. Um, we're big in that IV because um, we understand where the future is going and the demand for seafood, and we got to take care of that. You know, we got to protect our oceans. There's, you know, there's a lot of ocean uh, areas that are being overfished, and there's a lot of good management going on. When it comes to aquaculture, there's a lot of aquaculture opportunities out there. On that side, you need aquaculture to offset the wild stock. So that's where you know I, I keep on stressing. It truly is the future of seafood because there's not enough wild stock out there. As you can see, most of all our seafood has to be, um, we follow Monterey Bay Aquarium's uh, Seafood Watch. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with that. Um, it's probably one of the most recognized sustainability programs um, as far as guidance, what seafood is good to eat, you know, that you can feel comfortable buying as a consumer, knowing that it's managed in properly. And it goes into aquaculture, wild fish, it's everything, shellfish. And we follow that, you know, they have like a stoplight mentality, yellow, green, red. Um, yellow and green are your, your best, uh, green is your best choice, um, which the farm up in uh, Webster City, that would be considered a best choice. Um, you got your yellow rated, which is a good alternative, and your red, which is a void or red rated. Um, all our seafood, um, we make sure that it's either green or yellow rated, or it's equivalent to standards. Um, you heard Chris talking about the global standards. Um, we, we're very, very particular on what standards we do. Um, you see, there's a bigger push. I mean, he's, he's hit it right on. Retailers are pushing this industry. You know, they, they understand the negativity that's out there in seafood. So we're pushing these uh, vendors and suppliers to go after these extra, extra certificates. You know, your ASE certification, your global gap certification. Um, so that's, it's, it's very important and that is the future of seafood to have all that kind of checks and balance in place, you know, with your business and everything like that to ensure that you're providing the customer with fresh, safe seafood. That's truly how what they care about. And that's why they don't, necessarily turn to seafood right away is because they're afraid. They don't know how it was raised, how it was, you know, handled, all that process. But having all these in place, you can ensure that your product that's arriving or that you're purchasing at that seafood counter or at your restaurant is safe to eat. When you're jumping into quality, um, I'm just going to kind of bounce around here. When we're looking at seafood and we're, a lot of people say, oh, you guys always look at price. And I can tell you that's the bottom of our list. Um, it's to a point, yes, because you got to be competitive, you know, out in the market. You do. But marketing and, and promoting offsets that, I'll tell you that. Number one thing we look for, you know, and it's top on our list every time is quality. Um, that's the first thing we ask the supplier, you know, what kind of quality of product you got. You know, we look at there when you're looking at fin fish. Uh, majority of the fish we bring in is fillets. Um, we don't do a lot of processing at PDI. We used to. We kind of got out of that with all the HACCP regulations and, you know, it just, it's easier to bring in fillets, you know, and uh, there's a lot of labor involved in as far as filleting fish. So a lot of all our fillets and fish, it has to meet grade A standards. Uh, many may know, not know, but actually PDI has a full-time USDC inspector on hand, uh, on, on site 365 days of the year if needed. Um, he inspects all our fresh and frozen seafood um, that comes in the facility. Sometimes we have a USDC off site, but all our fresh and frozen seafood that you see in our counters and along with some of the frozen retail bags is USDC inspected. So then you got some standards you got to be equivalent to. Um, as you can see, the flavor and order, um, grade A standards. 
um, all our fillets boneless. I mean, we it, that's nothing worse than uh, giving a consumer a fillet of fish that has a bunch of bones in it. You know, you could scare them away quite rapidly. So we avoid that. Um, we do all boneless, and you can see we we go for the best uh, premium trim. We want to give the consumer the best quality fillet out there. Um, the problem you run into when you get into the other forms of trim, it all when a uh, fish or fillet is skinned out, you leave that membrane on the back. That right there, depending on how deep you go on your skin on on your cut on that fillet of fish, is going to give a could possibly give a bad flavor profile to the consumer. Um, you get into your salmons and stuff, that dark bloodline on the back. The longer, the bigger the bloodline you have on that back, the stronger, as you could say, fishy taste you can give to a consumer and scare them away from that. And it varies from species to species. Um, no blemishes in the fillet, so you're looking at perfection, you know, nice fillets like that. And this is some of the stuff our USC inspector does on a daily basis with our fresh seafood. Um, obviously, no parasites, anything like that on the product. And then on the end, it meets all USDC specs. Um, Chef kind of touched on whole fish. We do bring in some whole fish, and that's the stuff he mentioned with the eyes, the gills. Um, we look at that, see in there, and that's one good way to tell how fresh the seafood is. I won't talk much about shrimp and stuff like that, but all the product, what we're seeing in the industry, um, consumers like easy. You know, there's a, probably a small window of people that actually prepare, you know, shellfish, you know, when you get into your shrimps and stuff like that. Um, or your clams, but it's it's very important that we, we we really tried to do both, you know, serve a head-on product to them. It, there's just no demand for it. You know, the, the ethnic, ethnic market is growing. That's one of the fastest growing groups out there. Um, so we're looking at that, you know, looking at possibilities, A, jumping back to the headless. But right now, we, we stick mainly to a headless, easy peel shrimp. Um, meaning by easy peel, I don't know how you guys are familiar with that. It's a product that, you know, they make a slice down the back and typically it can remove the vein on the back of the shell or on the shrimp, and then it's just easy to peel. I mean, it's just one, two seconds you can remove it. Consumers like that because they don't like messing with the shell. Now you go down to Louisiana, it's the opposite. You know, everything's just headless. You know, they liked it and they'll eat it without taking the poop out, as you could say. So, whole different world down there. Um, but when it comes to shellfish, you know, and stuff like that, all our, all our shrimp and stuff like that, and it's in the seafood counter and stuff like that, uh, we, we try to do a chem-free, all-natural product. Um, doesn't have any of your sodium dry poly in there, um, so our sodium bisulfites if you're looking at a wild product. Um, no blemishes or black spots. Uh, black spots you get when you break the heads, and it's, uh, it's formed when it starts, bacteria starts forming, and the product is actually the shells and stuff you can see it on there consuming. Um, and then also it, you know, it meets USD specs as well. So. And when I come into quality, like you said, that is the number one thing we always look for. And we always typically like to see samples of the product. And, you know, with new vendors and stuff like that, it takes time because a lot of them, you know, they don't know. They're getting into it. And we're more into willing to work with them. Um, we worked with uh, the guys up there in the Iowa First Aquaculture on the first couple initial runs on that. And we got it figured out, and it's a great product. I jump into service. Uh, service is probably second to none. Um, we build longtime uh, business partners with all our vendors. We're not somebody that bounces around from vendor to vendor, um, buying one from this guy this week. This, you can't do that. I mean, we can't, um, not only on a safety aspect, but you know, price competitive, everything like that, and getting quality, you run into more problems than you do. Rather than that, we like to create that long-term partnership, you know, that friendship with that vendor. So then, you know, many of our vendors have been with us or partners with us for over 15, 20 years. Um, and their service, their quality and service is what reflects that, um, why we're changing. You know, we get, I can tell you, we probably get 20 to 30 cold calls a week between the three of us. Um, people want to sell us stuff and, you know, we have to turn them down. Um, a lot of people catch our interest, but it's just one of those things. We're loyal to our vendors and we're always willing to look at you know, other opportunities, what's growing in the trend. And that's why we were so excited about this local growing up Bear Monday up in aquaculture up in Webster City. As you can see, I won't go through all these, but this is what we guarantee or we ask our suppliers to provide for us. Um, and this is what they guarantee to us. A couple of I want to mention on there, HACCP, you know, all your federal gu guidelines and stuff like that for processing uh, your farms. You know, if it, you know, we're obviously talking about aquaculture, so, but it also goes in your process and facilities as well. Yeah, make sure you have all that, your checks and balances in place there. Um, and I'll kind of jump over to there, you know, obviously don't use any legal additives or antibiotics or chemicals like that. You know, a lot of, that's where the bad rap comes in from the imported product. A lot of people are using stuff they shouldn't be. And it's too bad because there's always going to be somebody that ruins it for everybody. And there is some people over there, they're doing it wrong way just to make gain a few extra dollars. Um, when it comes over there, the suppliers, uh, 
You also look at the most important, I'd probably say, is your third-party audits and stuff like that when we look at imported aquaculture and stuff like that, um, and also actually making our vendors do on-site visits. Um, we tend to kind of stay away from doing overseas visits and stuff like that. We rely on the supplier to uh, make, make those visits and have on, people on-site, you know, evaluating our product that's coming in. And the number one thing out there is, you know, this is where you guys come into place is traceability. Um, local seafood is probably one of the fastest growing, um, not only seafood, but it's everything, you know, apples, oranges, lettuce, everything. I mean, it's, it's truly, that's what people want. You know, me being one of, you know, the millennials and stuff like that, we're willing to try new things. You know, we're willing to try that species of Bear Monday. You know, probably 95% of the people when you go and ask them, they're like, what is that? You know, and, and we see it even when we try to sell it to our stores, you know, it's bringing it in. But it is. I mean, you, you talk on the national media scale, you know, Dr. Oz, everybody knows who he is. That's one of his superfoods. I mean, the guy praises this fish day in, day out. Um, so it's, it's very important, you know, it, it's the social media and the aspect and then that traceability, you know, being able to refer back to your local domestic fish. You know, I, I like I said, I'm passionate about seafood. And when I first heard this story like this, you know, I hear calls all the time from across the United States of people starting aquaculture and stuff like that, but they don't look at the bigger picture. You know, it's, it's, it's selling that local seafood. You know, they just want to get rid of it and move on to the next customer. It's, you're not going to grow the industry by doing that. You'll never, you know, help the growth of that if you had that. You need to help spread the word, spread that localization, you know, be proud of what you're doing, you know, especially here in Iowa, you know, I grew up in Northwest Iowa and, you know, I actually had opportunity to see some fish farms about 20 years ago and truly they were ahead of their time, you know, and they just went into it at the wrong time. You know, now they'd go into it, they'd probably be better off. Um, but it was one of those opportunities, who would say I'd be 20 years from now, I'd be talking about aquaculture. And I can't stress enough that uh, they talked about before, this is the meeting that, you know, you want to look back, probably look ahead 20 years from now. This is where it starts with you guys, and it truly is. I, I can't say it enough. Um, I'm very excited about especially being here localized, um, Ankeny, Iowa, having, you know, the opportunity, you know, to have a truck under our, in our potentially some of your guys' product and back into the stores within 24 hours. It's, it's unheard of. I mean, that's a, that'll sell itself, I'll tell you that. I'm going to jump, jump into labeling packs June quick. You know, obviously, um, that's jumping ahead quite a bit. But when we look at it, you know, always the packages have to be uh, sealed, whether it's in styrofoam, a wax lined cardboard box, you know, and then the seafood actually has to be in a plastic bag. This is what we require all our vendors um, so it's separate. And then obviously, you have to have some form of refrigeration in there where it's gel packs or ice. Typically, what we see, anything that's local, um, stateside, um, they, they stick to the, the ice or, ice on that because of the timing and excuse me everything like that um, gel packs you see a lot of your overseas imported stuff depending on the product um, and then obviously all your it has to be labeled correctly one of the biggest things in misconceptions you see out in seafood right now um, chef is probably the one that hits home quite a bit is the mislabeling of seafood so um, it's very important to make sure you have all your checks and balance in there when it comes to temperature um, temperature recorder we require this in all our loads um, from the processing facility to our PDI thing, so a temp recorder, um, we monitor our temperature to ensure we're getting, you know, the products handled properly. And I'll jump in here, this, I won't touch base on this, this is something we're adding for extra balances for traceability. Um, as you can see, this is all global, you know, in there, how stuff could bounce around quite a bit and lose where it's actually truly from. Um, we get into details of your sustainability certificate and actually where it's caught. Price, like I said, I won't touch one on because that really doesn't matter. Um, it does. It really comes down to you guys, how you market it and promote it. Um, it's very important, you know, to be competitive with the imported market, but we won't be. You know, one of the things you guys will be competitive with is your local. And I can't stress that enough. Um, I'll kind of end on that. And I, I just want to stress enough, you guys, this is a great opportunity. Um, I'll be over at the table um, with any questions. I'll hand out business cards, anything like that. We have unlimited resources at PDI. Um, we have a USCC inspector. We have guys that are day in, day out dealing with seafood. Um, we're more than willing. If you guys want to make a visit, tour the facility and stuff like that, I surely can work something out. Or if you guys just want to reach out to me, feel free. So thank you. I want to thank John and echo what he said in the past, you know, PDI has always been very cooperative with us, everything we've tried to do in the value-added ag area, you know, so 
Thanks again, John. Um, I want to take a second before we go on and talk about the Iowa uh, industry. We're a little bit behind. So uh, with respect to questions and answers, a little later in the day, you'll be able to catch everyone, and also uh, a little later here but just before lunch. They're going to start serving salads soon. Uh, Alan will be talking. You won't, that won't phase him a bit. I would like to, at this point, we have a number of wonderful aquaculture researchers from across North America with us today. If you are a scientist, a researcher, could you stand up, please? Come on, don't be bashful. Wombolt, stand up, too. You're an actual product of Iowa State. Thank you. Dr. Sommerfeld, would you please stand up? I'd also like to recognize Dr. Bob Sommerfeld. He's uh, in our fishing club, so I have to, and also uh, a fantastic person in the history of aquaculture. So Dr. Sommerfeld, thank you for being here today. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce Alan Patillo. Alan is, besides being a good friend, uh, He's our aquaculture extension specialist for the state of Iowa. He's also chair of the aquaculture extension technical committee for the North Central Region Aquaculture Center. Alan holds degrees in aquaculture from the University of Georgia and Auburn University. Patillo's overarching research theme is sustainable food production with focus areas in aquaponic crop production and food safety, bluegill hybrid striped bass, tilapia barramundi, and red claw crayfish culture. And, uh, you know, the crayfish, they're not technically a crab, but I love to say Alan has the crabs. You know, you don't get to do that much with your friends, but hey, what can I say? Al Patillo, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, uh, my name's Alan Patillo, of course. I'm from down south, so if I say y'all, you'll understand. Uh, that's you and all combined as one word, just so you know. Uh, I am your aquaculture extension specialist for the state of Iowa, so uh, I'm, I'm a resource to be able to connect you with other resources, people that, that know what they're talking about, and uh, I'm here to help you be successful in your aquaculture business. So um, I've also I've got some uh, business cards and, and things over on the table next to the fish over there. We put a display together for so you can see what the fish are supposed to look like, right? Um, but uh, anyway, uh, go ahead and jump into this so that we don't run over into your meal time too much, but... Um, so we're going to talk about uh, what aquaculture looks like in Iowa. So, um, of course, we've talked about this a little bit already, but the reason why aquaculture is so important is because we have this growing human population. Um, animal protein, of course, is one of those things that everybody really desires. It's, it's, it's good for you, especially fish is, is excellent quality for you. Uh, fish is right up there in terms of quality and percent protein in the flesh, um, but it's also more efficient to produce. Uh, so if we were looking at global fish needs, uh, aquaculture production needs, if fish were the only source of protein, which, you know, I like a good burger every now and again, but fish is really good for you and tasty. But uh, so if there's about 7 billion people on earth, uh, if you have about two fish per person per day uh, times 365 days a year, that's nearly 5 trillion fish every year that we need to produce. That's a lot of fish. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Weeks touched on this a little bit, but uh, world seafood demand, of course, is increasing, is ever increasing. Uh, our proportion of aquaculture product versus wild harvest is, uh, is, all, is becoming closer to one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, by the end of 2015, uh, we expect for those to be getting really close there. I mean, we're, we're actually uh, beyond this graph. It's sort of um, off the, uh, the linear curve, more uh, up, uptick there. Um, but uh, these, in 2010, we're looking at the trade deficit for the United States, actually imported 91% of everything that we use in terms of seafood. Um, about half of that coming from aquaculture, and back in 2010, of course, these numbers have grown since then, but it was uh, $10.4 billion uh, that we were sending to other countries that we could be keeping for ourselves in terms of seafood production, um, which is a really big deal. Um, aquaculture, it fuels our economy, so uh, for every one aquaculture job, there's about four other jobs created because of it, and uh, every one dollar in aquaculture farm gate value equals about six more dollars in the overall economy, so uh, we're helping other people grow in, in, as well as aquaculture. 
Another reason that this is really relevant for Iowa is because you already grow the things that we need to produce the feeds, uh, by and large. So uh, I know uh, Steve Hart will talk about this a bit, but um, you know, corn and soybeans, of course, go into these feeds, and we're trying to make more sustainable feeds that are less reliant on those uh, natural resources. Uh, another thing that's really interesting is that aquaculture has now surpassed uh, beef production. And that was in 2010, so we're, we're beyond that now. But uh, I know Dr. Dr. Lawrence uh, was pretty uh, heartbroken whenever I showed him this, this graph, because he is a, he is a, a beef avore, I guess. I don't know how you. Anyway, um, so now into types of aquaculture. Uh, we talk about food fish, bait fish, ornamentals, stock enhancements, sport fish, and uh, fee fishing. Those are some different areas that you can uh, capitalize on in terms of aquaculture production. Okay, so now I want to talk about what does aquaculture look like in Iowa. So I know we have a number of uh, current producers in the room with us right now. Could, could all of you that are currently producing for aquaculture please stand? And don't be shy. Yeah, all right, there we go. These are the people you actually want to talk to about uh, aquaculture because they're doing it and uh, they've got all the bumps and bruises that you don't have to have. So make sure and ask them. Um, there would be a huge resource for you. So just going around the states and places that I've been, um, you know, this is an ornamental production facility over in uh, eastern Iowa. Uh, Klubeck Koi, uh, of course, you know, I was there whenever uh, Bill Northey was there, uh, just taking a tour around and seeing what that looks like. That's actually, if I'm not mistaken, one of the top three producers in the, in the United States for sure uh, for Koi. Um, uh, Myron could tell you more about that, but um, um, also we have other opportunities in terms of sport fishing and uh, uh, combining a couple of different industries, uh, Baker's Fish Hatchery um, and Game Preserve up in uh, Zeering, Iowa, you know, combining a couple of things that, uh, that people really like to do. Um, I know I like to go over to, to Denny Baker's place on occasion. Uh, North Star Fish Hatchery, this one is really for sport fish production. Uh, they do a lot, they do walleye, northern pike, bluegill, crappie, catfish, uh, many of the native species around Iowa for stocking your ponds. Um, Iowa's first, uh, they're, they're in the room here today. Uh, these are our Bear Monday produ producers in Iowa, um, have an indoor recirculating system. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this, uh, may have seen their facility. Um, Farm Tech is a company up in Dyersville. Um, they're actually kind of getting into the aquaponics side of things. Uh, so we have several of those producers. That's part of my research area as well. Uh, so I've been uh, working with them quite a bit. Um, they, they're manufacturers, but they're also, you know, sort of help, I'm helping them research a little bit and find out what really works. Um, we have some different aquaponic producers around Iowa. So All Seasons Harvest is one. I believe they're uh, um, just north of Waterloo, Cedar Falls area. Early Morning Harvest, this is another aquaponic producer in Panora, Iowa. Um, actually, I believe the tilapia that you'll be eating today came uh, mostly from Early Morning Harvest as well as the basil. Um, we do have a processor that I know of, commercial size uh, processor for fish, but they mostly do carp from uh, wild capture. Uh, around the state. Uh, this all goes into European, uh, mostly Jewish markets for gefilte fish, things like that. Uh, but they're able to do some post-processing of fish as well as, um, you know, processing carp. You know, we've got quite a lot of those around Iowa. But um, so we were able to, to tour their facility. But, you know, that's one of the, the gaps in our uh, production line here is we need a, a processor for fillets for food fish. Um, so how do you find other producers? How do you find where to sell those products at? I mean, that's, you spend your first two years figuring out how to keep the fish alive. You spend your next forever trying to figure out how to sell them and where to sell them to. Uh, so we've got a uh, computer-based program, uh, internet program called uh, Market Maker. It's actually gotten a little facelift since, since I took these uh, screen captures. Um, you see the website down there. I've also got some information over here on the table. 
uh, with the fish on them, uh, with information about Market Maker. Uh, but it helps connect suppliers to the markets and helps connect markets to the suppliers and uh, all agricultural products. So not just uh, fish, but all agricultural products. Um, here's an example of, of the way you can use this program. You can actually search for, um, you know, this particular search is for average seafood at home expenditures. Um, and so it, it cr creates a map that shows where uh, most people spend their money at. Of course, that's centered around cities here in Iowa. Um, so you can find uh, where you might want to try to start marketing these products. Uh, you can also search in those areas to find uh, suppliers uh, or uh, retailers for those types of products as well. Uh, you can also, like I said, search for uh, the actual fisheries or the producers of these fish. Um, and if you, if you do that query, you know, you come up with about 10 different uh, aquaculture producers around Iowa, and you can, you can actually click on one of those and be able to pull up uh, some information about that person. So you can get their contact information, where they're located, uh, email, website, that sort of thing. You can also see what they produce and what sort of certifications that they have along with that, you know, fresh, local, that sort of thing. Um, and so, We've also uh, produced this marketing manual. Uh, Dan Burden pretty much wrote that whole thing. But uh, um, so this was provided through the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. So we you can actually get access to this marketing manual. Um, I believe it's 61 pages long. Um, you can download it from the website, or we can uh, also have copies printed up or whatever. But you can get that down there at that uh, web address. So. Um, with that, I don't want to stand in between y'all and your lunch, so 